uh, People versus Lyles. Unlike a calendar case, uh, the arguments are 15 minutes per side, and the first two minutes are uninterrupted. You may proceed. Good morning. Madonna Georges Blanchard on behalf of the people. May it please the court. I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. In People v. Schultz, this court stated, the meagerness of character testimony confined to one witness only tends towards a reluctance to reverse on the sole ground of error in charging the jury as to the importance and effect of character testimony. This reasoning applies today. This court should reverse the Court of Appeals opinion for the following two reasons. First, the Court of Appeals failed to examine the entire cause to see if it affirmatively appeared that it is more probable than not that the alleged error was outcome determinative. Had the Court of Appeals considered the minimal character evidence in light of the substantial evidence in support of defendant's guilt and the other instructions read to the jury, it would have found that the defendant did not meet his burden of showing that the alleged error resulted in a miscarriage of justice. And two, there was no error in the first place. The jury instructions already direct the jury to consider character testimony, or already direct the jury to consider all witnesses' testimony, and the good character witness instruction improperly instructs the jury as to the weight they should apply to the evidence. At this point, the people invite questions. What, are, what do you regard as evidence so overwhelming that the absence of this instruction can only be harmless error? Well, first we have to look at the purpose of the instruction, which was this one character witness who provided um, opinion testimony and very little reputation, te reputation testimony and had very little weight. And we know this because she didn't even live in we the state. We don't get to read, calibrate what the jury, what weight the jury gave. The, the right. jury heard that testimony. Right, they heard that testimony and we consider that. And they were given a general instruction right. that they get to figure out what weight to give all of the evidence. Right. Okay. And they consider. My question to you, however, yeah. is what, you said the, that the test was to determine how uh, the evidence as a whole should be um, considered in light of the absence of the instruction. So my question to you is, what was the evidence that you think is so overwhelming that makes the absence of this instruction harmless error? Well, first we have the motive of defendant. The defendant said, uh, blamed Melvin, the victim in this case, for the demise of his re relationship with Miss Kuhn. He also said that he was going to get that Melvin, if, and he said that if it was the last thing he was going to do, he was going to get that Melvin. So we know that he had some sort of vendetta against Melvin. Then we have the um, circumstances of this case. We know that the intruder was familiar with the layout of the house. He came in from the window in the basement. He put the puppy in the freezer. He knew the fuses to, to take out, to appropriately take the lights out. He knew that he would go upstairs. There was a, a butcher knife block set on the kitchen counter. He grabbed the knives from there. He didn't come in with a weapon already. He walked up the stairs in the dark and walked right into Melvin's bedroom and stabbed him one time in the chest. Then we have the, um, that's just What the ties the defendant to those actions? Well then, so we have his motive, we have the circumstances of the crime, and then we have the, um, the people, the two girls that were in the home, women now, um, testimony of what occurred that night. They heard Melvin gasping for air. They were told to go um, call 911. They're going downstairs, and as Melissa's walking down the stairs, she's walking slowly, and Kimberly says she's walking behind her, wondering why Melissa's walking slowly until she sees a figure in front of them too. And Melissa says she sees the um, def who she described as defendant, a person she's lived with for, the, they're unsure, but it's about three years. Um, before, she knew it was defendant by the description or the, the shape of the body in front of her and the very distinct smell that he had. Kimberly behind her also recognized the person in front of them as defendant. And then they leave the house. The person who left the house knew another exit other than the exit that the two um, girls were leaving from. And they go to their neighbor's house. And the very first thing they tell the neighbor, and the neighbor and the daughter testify that they said that the defendant is in their home. And so we have all this to connecting the defendant to the crime. In addition to that, once the lights are turned back on, they find defendant's shoes in the home with the sponge um, taped to the bottom. Actually, they found one shoe of, of a pair. 
and they identified those shoes as the shoes that defendant wears. All that together, we have motive, and yes, it's circumstantial evidence, but motive and circumstantial evidence carries a case all the time. And while the identification is not um, typical in, in the sense of the clear eyewitness identification in a, photo, in a photo lineup, these two girls knew the defendant. They lived with him. They, when you're in a room with somebody, you know their presence. And they saw him. They said that there was some light coming through, and they saw his figure, and they identified his cell. So when you consider that evidence, in light of the very little weight that the character evidence come, um, would have in this case, or has in this case, and then the other instructions read to the jury. The jury was told to consider Kim Harden's testimony, the character witness's testimony. They were told to consider all witnesses' testimony, each piece of evidence to determine whether the defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There was no instruction telling them not to consider Kim Harden's testimony, so why are we to think that they didn't consider her testimony in determining whether the defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? You, you do concede that the character instruction gives a thumb on the scale for the jury giving particular consideration to character evidence. Yes, and that's why the people believe that the instruction should not be given in the first place. Why are we highlighting this specific piece of evidence when it's not done in any other situation that this specific piece of evidence may alone sometimes create a reasonable doubt? That is not stated in any other instruction in all the criminal jury instructions. And it does put the thumb on the scale, telling the jury that. But that, it, that does make it, its absence consequential, does it not? Well, the jury is told to consider each piece of evidence in determining defendant's guilt. And yeah, but, but this one says, this one really look at more closely. Well, isn't by that the, right? Yes, the instruction does say that. Look so at this. why isn't that a consequential omission? Well, because other than the fact that it shouldn't be given it in the first place, the jury shouldn't be told to highlight any specific piece of evidence more um, <coughs> special than others, and it's not done in any other. You, uh, you did, in, no one's argued until this point that right. the, the, the instruction was legally incorrect. Nobody said that. The, there was not an objection in the court, trial court. You can't give that because even though it's a standard uh, criminal jury instruction, it is legally incorrect because it elevates this form of evidence over every other evidence. Right, that did not so occur. So that's not a preserved issue, is it? The propriety, legal validity of the instruction is not something that was preserved for argument here, is it? In the trial court? Anywhere. Well, it, w it was- You didn't argue that in the Court of Appeals either. No, it was not argued in the Court of Appeals. But to determine whether it was outcome determinative, we should, first let me ask, answer your first question. Did the last part, because it points to a specific piece of evidence and it wasn't, that part of the instruction wasn't specifically read to the jury, does that maybe raise the bar as to, to it changing the outcome? And that's, the answer to that question is no. Because the jury is already told to consider each piece of evidence and each witness's testimony and to see whether they believe them. And the jury was told in this case, you should think about each witness and each piece of evidence and whether you believe them. Then you must decide whether the testimony and the evidence you believe proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. So all you have to do is insert that witness's name and they're supposed to do the same exact thing. Now, they're also told what is a reasonable doubt, how that's created. What um, You have to listen to all the evidence. Does it create a reasonable doubt? Does the jury also need to be instructed that that alone may create a reasonable doubt? Well, we already know that because they're told that they have to consider each piece of evidence to determine whether the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So no, I don't think that that not giving that instruction would have changed the outcome. And we have to consider, okay, whether maybe if, if this court is going inclined to say that this instruction should be continue to be given to, um, to the jury and that part should have been read to the court or to the jury, I'm sorry. We have to see, would that alone create, a, would that have created a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury? And how do we do that? We have to look at the entire cause, all the facts of the case, including what was argued by the parties, what instructions were given, the actual testimony taken, the, the character witnesses' testimony, and that was not done by the Court of Appeals. They very, some rarely stated the facts of this case and um, left out um, many pieces of evidence and just said this was largely, uh, the prosecution's case was largely based on motive and circumstantial evidence, and because defendant presented a witness 
character witness and asked for the instruction, there was a miscarriage of justice. So is, is your real complaint that the Court of Appeals applied the wrong standard, or is your real complaint that they applied the right standard, but inappropriately? They applied, they said, they said the right standard, they said the standard of review, but then they went through Michigan's case law saying that when this happens, it's an error requiring automatic reversal. And then they stated very briefly at the end, regardless, you know, this is a largely circumstantial case based on motive, because, because of that, and he asked for it, and they gave this, and he had that witness, there was a miscarriage of justice. But the standard says that you have to look at the entire cause to see if it affirmatively appears, whether it's more probable than that, that the alleged error was outcome determinative. And this is a very high standard. I'm sorry? You have less than five minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. And Michigan courts are to presume the validity of verdicts and to reverse only with respect to those errors that affirmatively appear to undermine the reliability of the verdict. And that's just not what we have here. Even if the instruction was supposed to be given, and part of it, most of it was covered in the general instructions, we have to look at the character witness's testimony, and it was very minimal. She didn't even live in the community at the time this crime occurred, or three years prior, or two years after. She had moved to California. She didn't know a defendant. She grew up with him and knew him before, but when this was happening, from the time he met Ms. Koontz, she wasn't even living in the community. She said she had seen Ms. Koontz four times, and had only seen defendant when she would go to his mother's house, and he happened to be there. So we consider the minimal character evidence with the evidence of his guilt, and the instruction that they were told to consider each piece of evidence in all the witness's testimony. I'll reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. Good morning, Your Honor. It's Daniel Rustin here on behalf of Mr. Lyles. Quite honestly, I'm not sure why I'm here. The Court of Appeals, in a three-nothing decision, agreed, and the prosecutor agreed, the jury was misinstructed. This court has asked for whether the evidence, whether the misappropriate instruction affected the outcome, and I will say yes. If you recall, this is a 32-year-old case. None of the evidence was presented except from a memory, a 32-year-old memory of a 13-year-old. I would suggest over the years, memories change. I can give an example, several examples, of how a memory can change over those years. They had nothing against Mr. Lyles. The 13-year-old was upset with him. He recalled things that happened in her teenage years, and the only thing Mr. Lyles had to defend himself against was his good character at that time. I don't know what I was doing 32 years ago on a specific day at a specific time. The jury was asked to consider all this evidence, and if I recall correctly, the judge even wanted to bring in evidence that there was a warrant for Mr. Lyles' arrest from 32 years ago. I would suggest that the thumb of the judge went towards the prosecutor. The thumb acted as an input into the jury's consideration of not even to think about Mr. Lyles' defense. He had an opportunity to present a defense according to what he could do, which was his character. Presenting that in front of the jury, and I understand there are problems presenting character evidence before a jury, but that was his choice. The prosecutor seems to suggest that perhaps instructing the jury on this character evidence causes undue influence to the jury and bringing it to the jury's mind, but I would suggest to this panel that the instruction says you can consider this evidence along with all the other evidence, and oh, by the way, on the second sentence, it may tip the balance one way or the other, but that's up to you to decide. We don't have any other instruction that I'm aware of that says that this particular brand of evidence 
that can be outcome determinative, do we? That's correct. There is nothing that suggests that. But I am referring to the second sentence of the first part of the jury instruction. This is a singular instruction when all of the ones that I'm, at least that I'm familiar with, talk about the jury giving whatever weight it wants to give to that species of evidence, not that it has a potential for being more outcome determinative than some other kind. That's what's singular about this instruction. Correct. Was there any physical evidence presented to the jury? None. Okay, so even the shoe was presented by way of testimony. The same 13-year-old said those were Mr. Lyle's shoes. I'm sorry? The same 13-year-old who testified said those were his shoes. Did the absconding evidence come into the trial? I'm sorry? You mentioned the issue about the warrant and the whole dramatic thumb on the scale of justice. Did the absconding evidence come into the trial? When you say absconding, you mean? Absconding. He disappeared as soon as the warrant. Was that introduced? Yes, that was brought out. Okay. That he went. And also part of the testimony was when he was arrested, Mr. Lyle gave a statement, he was Mirandized, and gave a statement and explained the reason why he left was because the family was out to get him. Anything else? Counsel, do you think that the court applied the right standard of review here, the more probable than not standard, or do you think they just gave lip service to that standard and applied a different standard? I mean, that's the question. If there's a legal question here, I think that's the question. Otherwise, it's just this court reweighing what the Court of Appeals did below. But if there is a legal question here, I think it's whether the lower court applied the appropriate harmless error standard or whether they just gave lip service to the harmless error standard. Relying on the cases that precede the modern harmless error standard. I think they did apply the correct standard, and they determined whether it was harmful or not. Going back to the previous cases, as well as if I recall correctly, the court even did mention common law. Well, those cases that say if you fail to give an instruction that what I've characterized as a thumb on the scale for this kind of evidence, character evidence, it's fatal, is not compatible with the modern harmless error analysis. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Well, how then should we look at the opinion that seemed to be quite reliant on those early common law theories of character evidence? All the research that I have done do not come back with this fact-based scenario in this case of a 32-year-old case resting entirely upon the testimony of what was a 13-year-old witness. All these other cases appear to be factually based on whether the evidence that is presented do apply to character evidence, whether it's permissible or not. Whether or not a defendant has the right to present a defense. Part of the defense the cases have recognized can include character evidence. If I recall, one case indicated that might be the only evidence a person would have to defend himself against justice. But I understand that. But the thing that's critical here is we have a whole line of early cases that precede our modern harmless error analysis that seem to give particularized emphasis on the importance of this character evidence. And so if the Court of Appeals were merely applying the harmless error test, there would have been no need to rely on cases that seem to singularize character evidence. They would have looked at the whole record and said, considering the whole, the non-character evidence was very weak, and so if that instruction had been given, it would have made a difference. That's not quite how the Court of Appeals approached it. So your ultimate question is, 
whether the or not appeals. the current trend in giving character evidence instruction uh, would no, no it's really simple okay. did the court of appeals although it's citing the right standard fail to apply it no I, okay, that's what I need to understand why okay. even though it, it it relied on this line of precedent that all predates 1950 and doesn't square with our current standard for addressing whether an error was harmless because the the Court of Appeals recognized that a defendant can present a defense, a proper defense, which can include character evidence, and that wasn't done in this case. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I don't think anybody even okay. disagrees that when, that the, the jury is presumed to follow the instructions, so the fact the instruction wasn't given is meaningful. We're just asking about what do we do about the fact that the line of precedent that the Court of Appeals relied on all predate, predating 1950 squares with our current standard for assessing whether an error is harmless. I agree with the Court of Appeals. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. Got it. <laughs> Anything else? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> to answer your question, what well, we do, because the Court of Appeals relied on um, cases that just don't apply here. They completely ignore the statute requiring that the error must result in a miscarriage of justice. And what we could do is what this court did in People v. Young when it held, uh, when it reversed or um, overruled the ruling in McCoy saying that a, um, an instruction on an accomplice, accomplice witness instruction that's not given is not a rule of automatic reversal. And in Young, this court held that they applied, McCoy applied the wrong standard. It didn't apply whether there was a miscarriage of justice and it didn't go through the harmless error review that was required. And that's what happened here. The Court of Appeals relied on all the rule, the cases before that essentially said that there was a rule of automatic reversal, although that's arguable because in each of those cases there was a slightly different scenario that said that they actually instructed the jury not to consider the evidence in certain situations and they reversed for those reasons. It was two cases, um, it's People v. Lane and People v. Lewis that actually said that when the instruction is not given it's a rule of automatic reversal. Um, so. The, the people's position is, is that the correct standard was not applied. They relied on those cases and then they came to their conclusion and then they briefly said that they didn't, in light of all the, in light of the motive and the circumstantial evidence, this just, and the fact that he put a wet witness on and he asked for the instruction, there was a miscarriage of justice, yeah. but so there's more. So what should we do? Should we remand yeah. it to the Court of Appeals to apply the appropriate standard? This, this court could do that. They could remanded to the Court of Appeals to apply the appropriate standard, or they can find that when you apply the appropriate standard, then... Um, but that's not really work this court does for the most part. We, why wouldn't we let the Court of Appeals do that? Okay, this court could have them, you could remand it and have them apply the appropriate what, standard what to disregard the, the what prior... What should we instruct them? If, it, if we agree that the Court of Appeals does not appear to have applied the modern harmless error standard, what should the remand say? Remand order. The remand should say that they should be following at the statute. They should follow MCL um, 769.26. And th they could pay no attention to the pre previous cases that held that there was, um, it's a rule of automatic reversal when a particular good character instruction is not given to the jury. So they have to look at the entire cause to see if it affirmatively appears that it's more probable not that the error was uh, outcome Are you saying that our case is construing that statute uh, implicitly overrule those earlier cases? Do we have to overrule those cases? Well, not necessarily, because the cases are, are not all, they don't all say the same thing. So, for example, People v. Lane, People v. Lewis say automatic reversal. But People v. Schultz, which I want to mention because it was not in, in the People's Brief, it's 316 Mish 106 in 1946. This court held that it wasn't a rule of autumn. There, there isn't an automatic reversal. It was reluctant to reverse if there's minimal character evidence. And that's what we have here. We have minimal character evidence. The court should be reluctant to reverse. And they said that the defendant- Would you agree that our precedent on the, the value and effect of the character uh, evidence is squirrely? Yes, because this court said in People v. Whitfield, which is the first case on, on the notes of when this instruction is given, and People v. Whitfield said, if there, actually, good character evidence isn't that important. If, if what's, what always troubles me 
is we should always have, as best we can humanly do it, have one clear rule, not rules that seem, or statements in cases that are working at cross purposes and send people in different directions. I think you've described, and I happen to agree with you, those early cases not only are inconsistent with our modern uh, harmless error standard, but they are inconsistent among themselves. That's absolutely correct. And there is one clear rule that the court should follow and the Court of Appeals should follow, and it's the statute, 769.26, and that just was not applied here. I'd like to point out uh, one more thing, and that's that this is not a defense, this character witness instruction. It's actually not even listed under the defense's instructions that, that can be given to the court. It's a witness instruction about under the general witnesses along with police officer witness um, in that line of instructions. It's not considered a defense um, for the defendant in this case. Counsel, you, um, you're, you're at the end of your time, but I just have one quick question that kind of goes backwards a little bit, and I apologize for that. But you know, you've described the evidence in this case as overwhelming. I'm not sure I agree with that that's a, an appropriate adjective. But, but the, the, the question I have is when you listed the what I counted as five different categories of evidence or, or things, you left out the absconding evidence. Is there any reason why? Was that not particularly persuasive evidence? No, I mean, that, that's definitely something that, um, that was part, part of the evidence presented. I, I think that based on my review of the evidence, the, his motive and the circumstances of the crime and, and the witness's testimony, that, that is enough, that is substantial. I know that the defense counsel characterized it as a 13-year-old witness and it's a 30-year-old case. Are we minimizing victim's testimony based on their age of when the crime occurred? I mean, and then the fact that this is an older case, it's not that it wasn't sought to try to put, push this case through. It's, I mean, there a positive, the Was there a positive ID? I'm left wondering that too, uh, as opposed to a shadow that smelled and was the same shape? Is that, or, or was that, or did the witness say, you know, I'm sure that was him, or did the witness say that smelled and you know, was the same shape? As the him? witness said she's sure it was him. She knew that it was defendant in front of her at walking down the stairs. The, her sister behind her said that she thought that it was him. She didn't recognize the smell, but she was further back, and the sister that was walking down immediately behind the defendant knew that it was defendant in front of her. There was actually a light shining through, and so they could see kind of his shape a little bit more, and she was slowing down because she didn't want to, to run into him. So she knew it was defendant, and then she, they both immediately told the neighbors that defendant is in their home. So, no, there wasn't a lineup. I mean, he left. They haven't, I mean, the last thing he literally did was get Melvin. So, any further Thank questions? Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, when do we come back? Okay. Oh, a quarter of.